notes and do something with the info. You can take your gloves off if you like. It's fine. I do. Okay. It's a lie. Okay. So, what are we doing today, guys? After the mouthful, we're physical and chemical changes. Okay, we already talked about this in class, right? How can we tell the difference? Can't usually, yeah. And so, like, um, can you think of a chemical change? Digestion of food. Sure, sure. Combustion, digestion, corrosion. which actually are the same kind of reaction. So is corrosion. All those three are exactly the same type. We get to learn about types of reactions in a couple chapters, but they're all the same type. Um, so absolutely, I can't get my food back in the same condition after I've digested it or burned it or rusted it. Absolutely. Okay, good. So in part A today, part one, I forget, what do we call it? Part A. So what do you suppose we're doing there? Chemical or physical changes? All four of those are chemical changes. And it says that in the heading, but then people don't, don't remember. So in your lab report, there's a table where you're going to list all the reactions you're doing. One through, I forget. 12 or 13, let's see. 13. 13, that was a good guess. So on this table here, remember? Yeah, stealing, actually. So in this table here, reactions one through four are in the one that's called chemical changes. So here, it asks you to identify if it's a physical or chemical change. We don't even have to do those experiments right now to know that the first four, we're going to write C's. So you could just do that. That way you won't mess it up later. It's definitely chemical change. I'm telling you right now that those four are examples of chemical changes. Okay. Well, no, because then we're going to have a whole bunch. Five through eight are not physical because five through 12 are random mixtures. Could be either one. So in part B, that's reactions five through 12, your job is to, to make observations and figure out if it is physical or chemical, okay? And so we're going to do that basically because in, in part A, we've identified the kinds of things to look for to show chemical change, okay? Uh, so you said the, the volcano thing with the vinegar and the baking soda. How do we know that that's a chemical change? When you're done, it can't go back. It can't go back. How do we know there's a new, okay, so that's, that's a conclusion that you just gave me. How do we know it's a new chemical? Because it reacts. It reacts and bubbles. Bubbles. So when you're picturing this in your head, you should be picturing like a whole bunch of foamy bubbles. Those bubbles are the observation that leads us to the conclusion that a new chemical has been made, which is the same thing as saying a chemical change happened. So if we see gases forming, bubbles, whether it's big foamy ones like in the volcano reaction, or they're little teeny ones, doesn't matter. Bubbles mean a new substance is made. Because you start with a solid thing and a liquid thing and you end up with a gas, it must be something different, right? So that's the, that's the logic. So in the, in the four reactions in the beginning, bubbles is probably going to be a thing we're looking for. Okay? What else would tell us the chemical change has happened? Like the rusting, how do we know that that is a chemical change? You can't get rid of rust. You can... Well, you scrub it away. You can scrub it away, but there'll be a hole. It won't. Yeah, exactly. So if I, if I have a, like a fender on a truck that's rusty and I, and I try to get rid of that, it actually removes the metal and I can't get back to the metal that was there. Uh, also, what does rust look like compared to what it was? Brown. Copper. Uh, yeah. It changed color, right? Some rust can be red or kind of coppery colored. Some rust can be black, but it's still rust. Okay. So that doesn't look anything like the shiny metal that it had. So dramatic color change is another indicator of chemical change. So, so far, bubbles, meaning gas is made. Dramatic color change. What else can you think of that would show us a chemical reaction has occurred? Smell. Oh, like a change in smell, absolutely. Like when you're baking bread, it goes from like yeasty, kind of yucky, to like, oh, I want to eat that. <laughs> so a, a dramatic smell change, definitely. Now, if it's just smelly, that's a physical property. Oh, they're doing a tour. Mm, that's my boss. Anyway, so 
smell is a physical property, but when it's changing dramatically, like if it goes from smelling like skunks to smelling like flowers, probably not the same chemical, right? So chemical change. Okay, so we have bubbles, so gas. We have a dramatic color change or a dramatic scent change. What else? There's one more. Vapors? Ooh, two more. Vapors, that would be gases. Um, burning. So if we see light and heat, like combustion, you said earlier. Definitely a chemical change. You can't produce light without changing the chemical. So even, you know, the fluorescent bulbs here, that would be the color change also, right? If the color of a flame changes from red to blue, that would be a chemical change also. Okay. Um, there's one more, actually, that we're missing. Remember in class, we were talking about how to write a chemical reaction. We had that lead example, and I made you guys dance around. Remember that? Yeah. You can do it again. If you don't, I'll pick new volunteers. No? Okay. Um, so that reaction had two aqueous things. What does aqueous mean again? What? What did you think? Dissolvable and We were breaking bonds. You're right. We were. Absolutely. What? Dissolvable and Yes, dissolved in water. So we have two aqueous things, they look just like water, and we put them together and we got a solid out of that. So if that happens, that's a pretty good indication you've made a new chemical. Because you started with things that were dissolved in water, and you got something that was not dissolved in water, probably not, not the same thing as carbon. So we have bubbles, we have color change, we have smell change, we have fire, and producing a solid. When we produce a solid in science, we call that a precipitate. It doesn't just apply to rain. I know we hear about it in the, in the weather, but um, it also means a solid forming from two aqueous things. Okay, so you're gonna observe those, those things, those five characteristics in part A. And then in part B, your task is to categorize. Is it physical or chemical? You're gonna use um, all your observation skills. So let's talk a second about what it means to write an observation down, because that's an important skill, especially in medicine, right? You've got to observe how your patients are acting, feeling, etc. So you're going to practice those skills here with chemicals, because they don't argue. Let's say about the volcano one. All of you have seen that before, right? The vinegar and the baking soda, which is, I guess, foamy. Um, what kind of observation would we record that showed a reaction happen? Bubbles, it rises, it's foamy, she shoots out of the volcano or off the table or whatever it is, right? Um, those are good things to include. You might also smell something, right, because vinegar has a smell, and then it actually goes away after the reaction time because vinegar's gone. Um, you might feel some heat as well. You want to include every detail you can. Imagine that you're trying to write notes for someone who's not here in lab today, and they should have like a picture in their mind of what the reaction looks like. So, Sounds might be a thing too, yeah. So all of your senses get integrated to um, make an observation. The more description you put, the better it will be, okay? Um, if you just write a chemical reaction happened, that's not an observation, that's actually a conclusion. You laugh, but people do it. So the observation might be that it was foamy, or that it got hot, or that the smell changed, whatever details you want to put in there. But staying a reaction happened isn't an observation, okay? All right, so any questions about what you're responsible for in the report? Okay, you'll have them, and you should just come up and ask. Your observations are gonna go in the list sort of thing, it's like lines, and then your conclusions are gonna go in the data table, okay? And then there's some additional questions. There's no reason you can't finish this whole packet before you leave. Most people do. Okay. All right. So some safety stuff. Let's look at uh, at, the, at the procedure. Um, in each number, so each number is a reaction. At the end, it will tell you whether that substance can can whether it needs to be put into our solid or waste over there. So if we look, there's recovery bottles kind of on the side near your chemicals. So you have to read the very last sentence of each number so you know where things go. Correct, so it was on the pre-lab also. I'm glad we did that, that's good. Um, 
For the ones that don't specify, that means they're safe to put in the sink. Okay? If you have any question about where stuff goes, what are we going to do? Ask you. Cool. Good. All right. Um, a couple of warnings. Um, Yes, so that was a pre-lab question as well. Um, you guys know what flashbangs are? Yeah. If you play Call of Duty, you might know. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. If you don't, it's a kind of grenade that is used to make people blind. deaf and blind. Okay? The way it works, the flash part is by having magnesium filings in the grenade. So magnesium will ignite, which is what you're going to do. You want it to. It's got to have a really hot flame to do that. So your flame has to be... Right. Remember in the, in the safety video, it had like an inner blue cone? That's what you're shooting for. Um, I'll draw a picture on the board in a second of what, where you want to put your magnesium. If your flame is kind of lazy, seems slow, adjust your fuel. That's this one. To make more fuel, you actually need to turn this clockwise, and it's going to go down towards the counter. That will allow more fuel in. If you have too much, maybe your flame is like six inches tall or something, you want to go the other way, counterclockwise, towards the barrel. Okay, that'll control your fuel. Don't try to control it from the pillar because it's really hard to do. They're hard to move. Anyone know what this part controls? Oxygen. Yeah. So this gap here, you're gonna to have to bend down to see it. It's gonna be on your counter, right? You're not gonna be able to lift it up like this. But this gap here allows air in, which has the oxygen we need for burning. So if my flame is not bright blue, if it's like orange or or kind of dancing around like a candle does, then that means I don't have enough oxygen, so I need to make this a bigger gap. So you turn counterclockwise for that. To make it smaller, if my flame is just too big, then you can reduce oxygen by going clockwise. Okay? So everybody needs to be good at lighting Bunsen burners by the end of the semester. So if you didn't do it last week, try it. Be brave. You can do it. The other difficulty is with the striker. A lot of people struggle with the, the lighter part. Uh, you kind of have to turn it so that the flint is towards the flame, and you've got to, at the same time, push up, which is weird. So practice it, okay? If you're not seeing sparks, then you're not pushing up. You're probably pushing down, okay? Um, you're going to use the Bunsen burner in a couple of places today. Remember that fire doesn't, you know, I'm not going to leave my burner next to my papers, right? Why not? Because that'll be a chemical change and it has my homework on it and that's sad. Okay? We can't get it back. All right? So you're going to use your Bunsen burners a bit today. Be safe with them. That also means you need your hair tied back and any kind of like scarves or whatever need to go off. Okay. Um, you're also working with acid for the first time today. Is acid super good for your skin? No. 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 Good answer. That's right. Today. I like it. Um, remember in the video how we took the egg and then put the sulfuric acid in there and it made it look like it was like a scrambled egg? The same thing happens to your skin and your eyes if you leave acid on it, so don't. Okay? So let's just say that you get some acid on your gloves. What do you do? Take, take them off. Yes. And before you put the new ones on, be sure you wash your hands for a while. Don't use soap, just water. Okay? What if you get like a lot on your body? You could use the safety shower. You should probably tell me first because I know whether the amount and location is an emergency or not. Okay? If you use the safety shower and didn't need to, I'm probably going to make you mop because there's no drain. It just goes everywhere. <laughs> we could use the mopping actually. Doesn't it like not stop either? <laughs> It'll uh, eventually stop because you run out of water. Okay. So we're going to be careful of the acids. That also means even if you're done with the experiment, we need to leave our goggles on because other people around you are still working and you don't know if they're going to walk behind you with acid or whatever. So leave your goggles on the whole period until like right before you leave. Um, lastly, in number 13, what does it say in bold? Do this in the hood. Does that mean we need to go to a bad neighborhood? No. <laughs> no? What does it mean? Nope, not these ones. These are bench oh, ones. Or the, the white boxes. We have three. There's one here, one over there, and one in the back. Right? That's a hood. There are two light switches. They're currently off because if they were on, you would not hear me. They're very loud. So when you go over to work in there, you turn both of the light switches on, and it's going to turn a fan on that's really loud. That's how you know that it's sucking the vapors out of the building instead of in your face. 
All right, um, in this particular one, we actually want the light off for that because it's easier to see what you're doing. Um, let me know, especially if you're the first couple of groups to get to this point, let me know if you're doing this experiment. I like to hover around and make sure you don't die because you're making molten sulfur, which burns at a really high temperature and it's basically napalm. Okay, so I don't want anybody to fling it. Yes, it Sorry. does. I don't want you to fling it across the room, okay? And that's why I like to hover around a little bit. Another important feature of the hood is you can see it has like a glass sash that you can pull. It needs to be at least halfway. So the back is a good example of how it should look. The ones on the side are wrong. If you're standing there and the sash is all the way up, you're not getting any protection. Or, well, a little, but not enough, all right? So you want it about halfway down. You're supposed to look through the glass to see the experiment, not underneath it, okay? It also acts as a little bit of a blast shield, so if you have some sort of twitch reflex and your napalm goes flying, maybe it hits the glass or not. I've never had that happen, but I'm just warning you it's a possibility. Uh, if one of the two of you has shakier hands, I recommend that the ones that's more steady be the one to hold the spoon. Okay. The spoons are on your trays. They're funny. They're called deflagration spoons. They're really long. Why do you suppose they're so long? So you don't burn yourself, because it's going to get hot, it is metal, but it won't get hot at the top, so as long as you're not holding it like where the fire is, you'll be fine. Okay? The fire is really hard to see, so be careful. When, when, you're, when you're done with that part of the experiment, um, you're going to have a test tube with some stuff in the bottom that we can't get out. What's going to happen is I'm going to break the test tube for you. I don't want you to get cut, so I'll do it. Um, so when you're done, it's got to cool off and then come and get me. And I like to use this button in the front to do that. So we'll go over there and I'll smash it and then you can look at your product. Okay? Don't smash it yourself. It's okay if I get cut, but not you. All right, any questions? And we already said, don't look at the magnesium directly. Don't stare at it because it's a flashbang. Okay? You'll go blind. Not really. Eventually you'll go blind. It will burn your eyes though, it's very uncomfortable, okay? So you can look at it like peripherally, but don't go, whoa, okay? In this lab today, the fires that we're gonna make, like the magnesium will burn out on its own. Don't do this. That is not gonna put it out. What is that gonna do? Make it worse. Make it worse. Make it worse. And then it's gonna fling it at your neighbor, and that's just a bad situation. So, <laughs> so when it's burning, you can actually set it directly on the countertop and let it just go. And then you're going to make observations about what you get. Uh, we don't use the safety shower if your magnesium is on you and on fire because that will make it worse. So don't catch yourself on fire with magnesium or any metal. All right? Promise? I swear. All right, go ahead and get started.